Before we get started, too, I wanted to, you know, Jesus tells us we should pray for our enemies, and certainly the Russians are not my personal enemies. I don't know if anyone thinks of them as enemies personally, but I think a lot of us feel like they are the, on the wrong side of history on this, but they have their reasons, whatever those are. And uh, I think we should also we just do what Jesus said, which is to pray for our enemies. And, uh, and let's include the Russians and uh, their leadership in this. And I'm going to lead this prayer. And it's a hard one because I'm not quite sure what to pray. But Father God, we do uh, acknowledge before you the command given to us to pray for our enemies and uh, to bless those who persecute us. And while we uh, here in Germany are not really directly uh, you know, affected as a nation, by what is going on, and that our territory, the territory of Germany, hasn't been uh, attacked. There is still this sense, and even though I'm an American, that having lived in Europe for 10 years, that there is an affront uh, that is taking place. And so we lift up to you, uh, Vladimir Putin, and uh, the people around him, foreign ministers, people that are advising within this sort of chamber, echo chamber of fear that they are doing this in order to defend themselves from NATO and all the stuff that goes on in politics and power and money. And Lord, we pray that somehow you'll be able to break through and, and like we said earlier in the, in the service today, to, be, to reign as the Prince of Peace and to then this somehow be glorified. Pray you turn the, the Russian leadership from this destructive path, and it's a path of self-destruction for them. There's no way, even if they were to conquer the Ukraine, there's no way they come out of this better. They come out of this strategically weakened and, and made to look like the pariah around the world. Their economy is going to continue to be crushed, which will just make the lives of the Russian people that much more miserable, the Ukrainian people miserable. There's nothing that's really good that's going to come out of this. And so we pray that you would intervene. We pray that in the aftermath of this, as Benji has already pointed out, that you know, somehow there will be a picking up of pieces that, uh, that right now in our own human estimation, it's very difficult to see how this is put back together again in a way that brings about peace and harmony within Europe. And yet, this is our situation, and so we do lift this up to you. We pray for Russian soldiers. It seems like a lot of them don't even know what they're doing. Uh, it seems like, you know, from the news, from, and then granted, this is our side of the news. Only you know the full truth, Lord, but it seems like a lot of them are just sort of following orders and have ended up in the Ukraine and don't really know what's going on. Some of them, I'm sure, are going thinking that they are doing the, the just thing of liberation because they're told this, and then they get there and realize that nobody wants them there. And I can't imagine how soul-damaging it is to know that you are attacking civilians. You are blowing up apartment buildings. You are hitting schools. You are destroying hospitals. How that must just sear the human soul, especially these young people who are in their 18 to early 20s who are pulling the triggers and killing unarmed people around them, as well as the armed. It's just, it's, it just creates a huge scar in the soul. And so we pray, Father, for the, for the soldiers uh, from Russia. Pray for the leadership of Russia. We pray that they would see, that your spirit would work on them, and they would see that the, the thing that they are doing and the thing that they've been called to is really based in fear. It's based in an old mentality. It's based in lies. And help them to get out and to bring about a place of peace for themselves as well. Lord, I pray for the Russian Orthodox Church. And I pray for the church leaders that have already declared that everything within the Ukraine is morally evil. They've declared the Ukrainian people morally evil. They've declared the Ukrainian Orthodox Church is morally evil. Pray for these folks in the Russian Orthodox Church. I have no idea where they're at emotionally or spiritually. I have no idea if it's really just a power thing. You know, I know the history, but I don't know the people. And Father, I pray for these leaders, these, the patriarch of the 
Russian Orthodox Church, that you would convict his heart if his heart is at all towards you. Convict him to be a leader of peace, not someone that's supporting war. A leader of peace, not someone who is just declaring the entire Ukrainian nation is morally evil. That he would be someone that could stand up and speak some hope and some sense into political leadership. And really, that's going to be a miracle. It's going to be having to be the work of you. But you've done it before. You've hardened people's hearts, and you've softened people's hearts. We pray that if it be your will for peace, that you would soften the heart of the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, and that he would push towards peace instead of destruction. And we lift up to you those people who, uh, mothers in Russia and fathers in Russia who've lost children already. They're human beings too. And the pain of their loss, and especially when they find out it was really just for an immoral reason, is going to be very painful for them if it hasn't been already revealed to them. So Father, we pray as a parent myself for those parents who've lost their kids in an unjust cause and will one day have to deal with that and it's going to be painful. So we pray for our enemies as you command us. Forgive me, Lord, for not being terribly heartfelt, not really wanting the best for uh, some of this leadership. But I commit it into your hands and we commit this prayer into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Gospel of Matthew. We are back in as we continue our journey. When I was a fairly new Christian, I had been a Christian, a dedicated Christian, about a year when uh, in between semesters, the summer semesters between, in university, I went to be a summer missionary. And I was sent to work in uh, Houston, Texas, in the inner city of Houston, Texas. And I remember at the time when I was being sent to Houston, Texas, being quite disappointed because I thought, why would I go to Houston, Texas to be a missionary? This is one of the most evangelized cities in one of the most evangelized areas in the world. Texas is considered, in the U.S., we call it the Bible Belt. It's that southern part of the U.S. that is very heavily evangelized. Uh, Christianity is really part of, the, part of just the way of life and the culture. It's very different from where I came from in the Northwest. And I didn't really want to go to a place that was already evangelized. I wanted to go as a missionary to some new place. But they sent me to Houston. And there was a group of 30 to 40 of us that lived in this large house, and, uh, and it was actually when I got there, realized that there was a lot to do, because as a city, Houston still struggled a lot with uh, poverty, issues of poverty, and we were in the poorest area of Houston. Uh, that's kind of the code, inner city means poor area. Uh, we were living in that area. There's, they still suffered a lot from racism. Uh, There's a lot of divisions between people from uh, South American descent or Mexican descent and African Americans and, and white Americans. There's a lot of racism. There's a lot of crime. But there is also this very hard rejection of Christ. It comes from having heard it all and then rejecting it. That sort of that folk, those people that say, I've heard this already. You have nothing new to tell me and I've already rejected it. You know, there's a certain kind of hardness to that kind of rejection that's different from the person that just really doesn't know what the story is. Because in Houston, there's literally a church on every corner. You can't go more than, you know, 100 meters and not come across a church. And it's very highly evangelized. But we were working and we were working at doing vacation Bible school and, and kind of a social ministries. And as I said, we lived in this house all together. And, and so one of the things we had to do is we had to clean up after ourselves and so we'd be assigned certain tasks and what for and whatnot. And one evening I was assigned the task of doing the dishes with this other guy. And cleaning up after 30 some people after dinner, all the dishes by hand is no small task. And so I was down there doing the doing the job, and this guy didn't show up. So I went to go find him. And I found him, he was lying in his bunk. We kind of lived in these kind of a dorm situation, these bunks. 
And he was there reading a book. And I thought, well, maybe he just didn't know. So I said, hey, you're supposed to come and help do dishes. And he rolled over and looked at me and says, I'm not going to do dishes. And I said, why? And he said, because I shouldn't have to. I was very confused at this point. Like, well, what's going on with this guy? But also, I was kind of young in my faith. And if you know me at all, I, I, I have a little bit of a temper even now. And I hadn't, I hadn't been worked through very much when I was only a year or so into my faith. So I told this guy, you had better come and do dishes with me now. And I think I might have grabbed him by the collar. I'm not quite sure. And... Uh, he sat up and he, and he reached over and he held up this piece of paper with a bunch of names on it. And he said, these are all the people that I have saved during my time here. How many people have you saved? I remember looking at it and just in utter confusion at this point because I had never run across a person so crass that they would list the people that they, that they have saved. And no one else in the in the you know, the mission house here was doing that. It was the only one. I'd never seen this before. It still kind of blows my mind. And of course, I had no list. No one else was keeping lists. I didn't know what to say. And I think part of the reason why I had no idea what to say to this is because my own personal experience had been so different when it came to, came to hearing the gospel from folks. I'd never had anyone just try to get me to become a Christian so that they could put my name on a list. I'd never experienced that. Everyone who had ever reached out to me did so with, with a desire to invest in my life, with a desire to, to go deeper into my life, sharing the gospel of Christ with me. Even when I rejected it, I had peop the people who were around me, my pastor's wife used to pray for me all the time, which she let me know after I became a believer. You know, but she never tried to put me on a list. My Sunday school teacher in high school, he was a great guy. He never tried to put me on a list. I just didn't understand this. And when I became a believer, God sent this guy into my life. His name was Steve Rankin, and I've shared with you a little bit about him before. And he decided to disciple me and mentor me my first year in university along with a few other students. He just lived with us. When I say lived with us, not like lived in the room with us, but shared his life with us, spent a lot of time with us. And so this idea of lists was completely outside my experience. And I managed to persuade the guy to help. But over the next few weeks, it became apparent to everybody, this guy was really just about building up his own resume about his own righteousness. And it was the first time, and I didn't recognize it then, but looking back on it, it was the first time I ran into basically a modern-day Pharisee, a person who was defining their life and their relationship with God based upon the works that they did, and then they could take that and compare it to other people. Here's my list of the people I've saved. Where's yours? Well, last week we started looking at a passage of Scripture where Jesus begins to, to share with the Pharisees, I guess is the most charitable way you could put it, some of his disappointments with them. And basically what he really does, if you were here last week, he rips into them with a zeal and fervor that is reserved only for the religious leaders. You never see him tearing into people of obvious sin, like the prostitutes and the people caught in adultery and even the tax collectors who were, they were evil, they were sinners because they were collaborating with Rome, not because working for the tax department makes you a sinner, just in case there's anyone here, given that Germany has, what, two-thirds of the world's tax laws. But I digress. His harshest words were reserved for those who were the religious leaders. And it's never been lost on me. And when I read his accusations and his rebukes, it's pretty easy to make some connections to modern-day Christianity because people are people, and we tend to make the same mistakes over and over and over again. And, you know, just in the news, what we just prayed about, it's the same mistake being made over and over again, and it's using the same rhetoric, you know, the, re the, the, the reasons that Putin is giving for attacking the Ukraine is to defend the ethnic Russians whose rights are being abused. 
Not to put too fine a point on it, but if you look back about 70 years, there was a leader in Europe that said the same exact thing as he began to take over Europe. Nothing new under the sun. And so last week we looked at at Jesus' rebuke on the Pharisees for their love for celebrity, for their love for being seen as righteous. And today we're going to look at this attack that he puts on them about how they're going about building up their ranks, how they're going about making disciples. And he says this, Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor you will let those enter who are trying to. Woe, you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice, the son, twice as much a son of hell as you are. Now, you might notice in this translation there's not a verse 14, because, and we've, we've talked about this a couple weeks ago or several weeks ago, Verse 14 isn't in the oldest and most reliable manuscripts, and so that's why it's not there. But if you're curious, it's not like there's something crazy in there. It says this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers. Again, going back to being looked at. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. Now, like I said, this is not in the oldest manuscripts. It's a very Jesus thing to say. You know, it doesn't go outside of of Scripture or anything like that. It doesn't, it's certainly nothing weird. It falls right into the teachings. But it kind of breaks up the thought of this, how they go about making disciples. And so we're going to approach this without verse 14. But I wanted you to have it in there because I don't think the Bible needs to be a mystery. I don't want folks thinking, oh, maybe there's something in verse 14 that should make us all become, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses or something. No, there's nothing in there. It's just saying, you know, you're... You're pretty horrible people, Pharisees. And it just continues on with that thought. But let's go back. Let's just look at 14 and 15 and ask the question, what is Jesus talking about here? What's he accusing the Pharisees of doing? He says that they, they close, they shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. But, but how do they do it? How are they doing this? It's not because the Pharisees are refusing to tell the non-Jews or the Gentiles about God because that really wasn't a big issue. Uh, It might kind of sound a bit depressing, but the truth is the Jewish people then and today aren't terribly concerned about the souls of non-Jewish people. It's just not on their radar. Have you ever noticed Judaism's not very evangelical? They don't reach out and try and evangelize because you're born into it. If you choose to convert, you can choose to convert, but they're not terribly concerned about your soul. It's just the way it is. And so when Jesus is talking about the Pharisees here shutting the door in men's faces, he's talking about shutting the door in people's faces who are fellow Jews but don't have the pharisaical philosophy. Like we've talked about, they're the Sadducees, they're the Essenes, there's different kind of Jewish groups. It's just like there's different Christian groups. And he's saying to them that even when one of these folks change their mind to come to your philosophical point of view, to have a pharisaical point of view, which doesn't necessarily mean bad in the way we think of Pharisees, but, you know, that they accept the entire Old Testament as the Word of God. For example, a Sadducee, I've told you in the past, only saw the first five books. This is who he's talking about here. And he says that when they become a convert, they shut the door and make them twice the son of hell. But let's go back into the shutting the door. How do they shut the door? What are they doing? What is Jesus talking about? Well, he's talking about the Pharisees doing the same thing that people do today, and that is that they made the faith about works. They made salvation about thinking like us, doing the rituals we say you have to do. Because a works-based faith is not about a personal relationship with God. It's about performing the tasks that are necessary in order, to you, in order for you to earn God's favor when he takes notice of you on judgment day. And the idea is that if we can do enough good works, then somehow on judgment day, I can present the Lord with a list that says to him, essentially, you owe me heaven because I have done this, these good works. And this kind of works-based faith is dry, it's empty, it's discouraging, 
But as human beings, we default back to it time and time and time again. We default back to this because being created in the image of God and yet broken, we want to be in control of our own destiny. We want to be in control of our own eternity. We don't want to have to depend on anyone else, even though we know that really there's nothing I can do logically. We know there's nothing I could do that can make the one who created the entire universe say, oh, well, I guess I owe you. We still think somehow we can. It's just like how most of us deal with death. Most of us know that people die. And yet there's this thing that lurks in the back of our mind that thinks, somehow it's not going to happen to me. Somehow I'm going to escape it. You know, we all kind of think that. It's, it's back there. And the younger you are, the more you believe that. But it's not true. You know, unless Christ comes back, we're all going to face death. In a hundred years, everybody here will be dead. Unless Christ comes back. And that includes the young guys in the back there. Crazy, huh? You're going to croak. And we're kind of the same way when it comes to works. And we know we can't make God owe us. But yet, there's this part of us that trusts our hands more than we trust the hands of God when it comes to our soul. And the Old Testament, there was this learning process that the people went through, you know, the people of Israel regarding the law. But if you look in the Old Testament, many of the heroes of the faith, and this is actually pointed out in the book of Romans, many of the people who were the heroes of the faith were people of faith. They were not people of law. In fact, Paul writes about this a lot in the book of Romans. Uh, this is out of the book of Galatians. The just shall live by faith, however the law is not based on faith. And if you go into this book of Galatians, it is a powerfully deep book very about this whole issue here. But Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, they were all people who lived before the law was in place. They essentially had a relationship with God that was faith-based with a few rituals and ceremonies to help them understand that they were other, that they were serving a different type of God than, say, the, God, the false gods of the, the people around them, like Baal and Moloch and gods like that, Dagon. They were, they were worshiping a different God. So there were some things that set them aside, like circumcision. But they weren't saved by circumcision. And this is something the Apostle Paul also deals with quite a bit in the New Testament. And even when the law of Moses was put into place, it was debated over and over and over again and continues to be debated to this day in, the, in your Jewish communities because they're trying to understand, you know, well, what does work mean? What, what does it mean to, to love your enemy? What does it mean? Actually, that wasn't in the law. What does it mean to take vengeance on your enemy? How do you do this? And Jesus often ran afoul of the Pharisees because even things that weren't written in the Mosaic Law but had become such a strong part of tradition. For example, there's nowhere in the Mosaic Law that it says you cannot help a person on the Sabbath. There's nowhere in the Mosaic Law that says you cannot heal or reach out to someone who is in pain on the Sabbath. And yet when Jesus would heal on the Sabbath, the Pharisees would freak out because they had already decided that that was work. And you could not work on the Sabbath. And so what Jesus was dealing with is oftentimes what we deal with today is that you have people who have defined things and set things into place, who are, uh, people who are works-based, set things into, into place which they have no legitimate reason for being there. There was no legitimate reason for people to be angry with Jesus when he did healings on the Sabbath. You can find nothing in the law of Moses that speaks against it. But this is what we do as human beings. We like to define our world in such a way that we can measure things. We like to measure things, measure success, measure what it means to be uh, complete with the task. And the early church fell into the same trap because in the early church, after they found, if they had the same Bible that you have, probably because many people were illiterate back in the day, they fell into this trap of not being able to read the Bible, but they were told by their leaders, this is what you need to do, and works and, and these actions of faith that was be illustrative of what it means to live as Christ, uh, live as a Christian, became rituals. They became ossified. They became like stone. And what, was, what had been put into place originally to kind of help people who were mostly illiterate to understand some lessons of Christ, confession is a good example, and what it means to confess your sins, well, you did it with the priest to kind of help them to understand this is what you do with God. It became, it became like stone that, no, you must 
only confess to the priest because now the grace of God flows through the priest. And that's where they go, whoo, way off the reservation there. It's just not, it's not in the scripture. And so we fell into that. Instead of believing in the power of the cross because of what the cross symbolizes, they started believing in the, in the shape of the cross to be something they could wave around to ward off evil. It made no sense. Because the power of the cross isn't in the shape. The power of the cross is in what happened upon the cross. And to wave around a random shape and say this is going to take evil away makes no sense. I may as well wave this thing around and say, hey, evil's going to be held away. There's no power in a shape. But this is where people's minds went. And finally it got so bad that the church was telling people that they could spring a dead relative out of hell if they just gave enough money to the church. And that they could actually buy the right to sin by giving enough money to the church. This is called the selling of indulgences. And saying that you can buy a person, a relative, out of hell, and actually it was, a, it was a, Johannes Eck was the guy that was doing this, and I can't, in, in German it, kind of, it, it rhymes basically, you know, when the coin in the box rings, a soul from hell springs. And, uh, and it actually rhymes in German too, the ringing and the springing. And, uh, and this is what Martin Luther was against. This is really what kind of set off Martin Luther, the German reformer. He's like, this is crazy. And he began to, to speak against it. And as you know, uh, because he was protected by a prince who had his own issues with the church, which were more political than anything else, you know, Martin Luther survived. He wasn't the first one that had a problem and wanted to bring about Reformation. He's one of the ones that survived. And, uh, and the Reformation began to change the church. But however, like the proverb says, like a dog that returns to its vomit is a fool that repeats its folly, we keep returning to the way where we measure our faith over and over again through works. And this is really what the false forms of Christianity, like Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses, their falseness isn't just found in their understanding of Jesus, which is kind of out there, really out there with Mormonism. But it's more about the idea that both these teach that you have to follow certain works. You have to follow certain rituals in order to ascend in heaven. In Mormonism, there's three levels of heaven. So whatever level you get to has a lot to do with what you do, what works you do here on earth. But you know what? Even biblical churches have a tendency to lean towards works as a measure of righteousness. For example, I grew up, in the, I grew up spiritually in the Southern Baptist uh, tradition in the U.S. It's the largest Baptist group, pretty conservative. And one of the things that they pretty much taught was that it was a sin, serious sin, to drink anything with alcohol in it. And this gets, this gets put into you young when you're in the Southern Baptist. And now let me say, I gained so much from being part of the Southern Baptist. This isn't to bash them, but they have this hang-up about drinking anything with alcohol in it. And I always found it funny because there's actually a, a uh, scientific study done by the convention. They actually brought people in to, to assess the health, the, the physical health of the people of the Southern Baptist Convention. And they concluded that the Southern Baptist Convention was made up of the fattest, most out-of-shape people of all the other denominations. Why is that? Well, because we're Baptists. We like to eat. It's what we do. We get together. Every meeting I went to used to be piled with, you know, food. And, and while we're not going to let any kind of alcohol pass our lips, we'll let those powdered sugar donuts pass our lips as often as we can. And I remember going to meetings when this, when this study came out, and we started going to meetings, and instead of plates of donuts, there were places of chopped vegetables and stuff. And if you wanted to see a group of grown men almost cry. <laughs> yeah, I'm no joke. They looked at, one time, Cindy and I, we went to this thing, and they decided, there, you know, there was a response to this study, and we went to this, uh, re, uh, it wasn't a retreat, it was like a, well, it was like a leadership training thing, and they served fish, kind of, you know, not fish and chips fish, you know, deep fried and, you know, beer batter and, and fries, it was like fish, <laughs> and this guy just kind of shouted out, says, I'm ordering pizza after dinner for anyone who wants to join me. <laughs> And lots of hands went up. <laughs> uh, 
But then there's issues of faith, you know, which really do walk a line, and, and it's something to deeply consider, because there are times it seems like there's almost, there is a certain expectation that we do certain things. Baptism is one of them. Baptism is kind of one of these things that the church has wrestled with for ever since the church has been around. You know, infant baptism or believer's baptism. We teach a believer's baptism. Do you need to be baptized to be saved? That's a big question people roll around with. There's some Christian denominations that look at the end of the book of Mark, which says those who believe and are baptized will be saved. They say you must be baptized to be saved. There are others that look at the Bible more as a whole and will say, well, the guy on the cross who Jesus said today you'll be with me in paradise, he didn't have time to get baptized. And yet it seems he was saved purely by faith. And, and, and his faith wasn't very well articulated. All he said was, when you enter your kingdom, remember me. So I guess in that, in that simple statement, he was acknowledging you know, Christ's place as some kind of Messiah. I guess if you really sat down and talked to that thief, you probably didn't have time to have a deep theological understanding. But you know, when you enter your kingdom, remember me. And Jesus says, today I tell you, you'll be with me in paradise. But we see throughout the scripture, you know, Jesus talks about the way we make disciples is we baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So is that a work? Is that a work? Or is it an obedience by faith? And is there really any difference? You know, these are questions. But the more important question when it comes to discipleship, and that's what Jesus is talking about here, going and making disciples, I think for all of us, is the question, this question, who are we trying to become like? And who do we want others to become like? Are we trying to become like Christ and do we want others to become more like Christ? Or are we trying to make others into our image? Are we trying to turn them into us? And I think this is really where Jesus gets at with the Pharisees when he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when he becomes one, in other words, when he becomes like you, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. So you make him like you and then some. And in that process, you drive that person further away from Christ. You drive that person further away from God. He would be speaking in a Jewish context, so they'd be driving that person further away from the God of Israel. So in other words, the Pharisees would travel far and wide to make these converts into the image of themselves instead of help them grow into the image of God. And centuries later, the same thing happened with the church, especially in the modern mission movement, which modern is kind of relative. I'm talking about the mission movement that started in the 1700s. And I want you to know, just like I, I hold my Southern Baptist roots uh, dear, dear enough that I, like I could talk about my family, point out some of the weirdness, but I love them. It's the same way with the, as I feel. You know, I hold missionaries in very high regard. I had every expectation in my personal life to be a missionary. That's why I studied agriculture. I have two degrees in agriculture with the idea that I was going to be a missionary that would go into a, a land that that, you know, needed physical bread as well as spiritual bread. That was going to be my plan. That's what Cindy married into. She didn't marry into this pastor idea, which I hear about now and then. But most people will now acknowledge that those missionaries that came out of the U.S. and Europe, which were basically white Western missionaries, they had a tendency to equate things like political philosophy, or how one dressed, or what one believed about economic uh, systems like capitalism, all were wound up in what it meant to be a Christian. We kind of laugh about it, and it's kind of a crude statement, but they often talk about the early missionaries as their primary focus was putting bras on the natives. You know, they would get there and just like, well, this isn't the way uh, uh, Christian dresses. And they began to, you know, they really focused on westernizing. You can't just worship with drums. You have to have an organ. My dad used to live in, uh, we used to live in Ghana. And my dad told a story one time, way up country in the north, there's this river, the Volta River, which runs through most of Ghana. And he got way up into the north, and there's this village, and they were so excited to see my dad show up, just because he was something new. And they took him, and they showed him an organ that generations earlier, some missionaries had somehow brought from England, shipped all the way up the Volta River to this tiny village 
And there it sat. No one knew how to play it. It was completely broken down, but they had it. And I just think about the kind of effort it took to get this organ. But that's kind of what you know, the mindset was. And it wasn't until the 1970s that you really saw mission you know, groups begin to realize that there's a difference between how one dresses and what political ideology you might have and what it means to be a Christian. You don't have to be a Westerner to be a Christian. And it, that took some, some thinking because we have a tendency to want to make people into our own image. We have a tendency to see us as normal. And at an international church, that, that doesn't really ring maybe as strong because there is no one singular normal in IBCD. But you look at the way we do our church service, it's pretty U.S.-based, right? We sing songs that are kind of from the, the West. We kind of have a church service order that's very Western. The way I stand up and preach, this is a Western way of doing things. So we do. We, we kind of do the same thing, even unconsciously. So it's been a question in my life because of my relationship with the Steve Rankin and, and, and how important he was into my life. How, how should we really make disciples? Because I've yet to see a program that the church has put out, and Southern Baptists are amazing at putting out programs. Those of you who have ever done Beth Moore studies, you know the deal, man. In that little box, you get Bible studies, you get books, you get DVDs, you get all that stuff. Nice little program sets up for you. It's the same with evangelism. There's all kinds of programs you get that come in a box set. You put it up there, it's the program. I've never found these programs to work very well. And I think it's because we have this idea that making disciples is really just about making sure people follow a certain set of rules, read a certain, certain set of scriptures, do a certain number of things, and that will make them into disciples of Jesus Christ. And yet, when you look at Jesus, where in the Bible do you see? And then Jesus said, behold the box set. <laughs> where do you see the disciples saying they took out their workbooks and they filled in the blanks? <laughs> it's just not there, right? It doesn't mean these things are bad, but what Jesus did was completely different. And so I want to go through, I think, three things that we see Jesus do, and also three things that I found effective in my life. This is kind of one of those places you can sort of take it or leave it because this is, really speaking, this is very subjective. But first of all, coming to this question, how do we make healthy disciples? And disciple-making is something we are all to be involved in. I think one of the first things you need to do, and this is after a person has, you know, accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, they've sought repentance, forgiveness of sin. So this isn't about leading them to that place of salvation. This is afterward. How do you make a disciple? And I think one of the things we have to do is help people find that image of God that they are and grow into the good that they are. Because there is good in the saved person. Even if that good is only the Holy Spirit, there is good in there. And there are some aspects of them that have been created in the image of God that needs to be lifted up. As well as there are aspects, for sure, that are not of God that need to disappear and go, go out of their life. But we have a tendency to focus on the negative. Change this negative thing, change that negative thing, change this negative thing, and then you'll become more like Christ, instead of encouraging the good that is there. The guy that discipled me, he gave me a wonderful gift because he showed me that you could be a Christian and you could have fun. You could be funny. You could smile. You could, you, you could live with a wonder to life and a thankfulness of heart. Being a Christian it can, be, is, is, it can bring color to your life. But so many people live Christianity as if they're living in a black and white world of what is right, what is wrong. And there is no color. There's just their notion of what is right and what is wrong. And in that notion of, of black and white, colorless, right and wrong, they impose that upon other people's lives. And funny enough, there's not a lot of people that really want to live a black and white life with no color, with no joy. And Steve let me be who I was. If he had told me I had to wear a suit all the time, be serious, and try to make my life as boring as possible, I wouldn't have survived. And if I had become a Christian in different parts of the U.S., I wouldn't have survived because of the works-based philosophy that was around it. I was where God needed me to be. Secondly, when it comes to the conviction of sin, I think a lot of times we spend 
time as disciple makers trying to point out the wrong in people's lives, especially when we see something that we know is destructive to them and the people around them. And we make it, that's our focus, to try and break them out of this sin. Like I had this friend of mine, I've told you before, he's a British guy. He said, hey, you know, Jeff, if I didn't drink as much and fornicate as much and curse as much as I do, well, I'd be a Christian too. And I remember you know, him telling me that, uh, and it just kind of has bounced around in my head for the last 20-some years. Because the point is, is it's not about make cleaning yourself up in order to become presentable to God to be saved. It's allowing God to explore the areas of your life. You let your heart be open, let the Holy Spirit explore your life, and the Holy Spirit will convict you in places it's time to be convicted of sin. And the reason why I'm saying that is so many times in our heads we have this idea that when we ask Christ for forgiveness and he forgives us of our sins, he totally does. But we are unaware of a lot of the sins that he's actually forgiven us of. We don't know it. We, don't, we, we can't quantify or name all the things that are screwed up within our soul. Some of it we see, some of it we don't. And it's not until you grow in faith after a while that then these things become revealed and then you can deal with them. This is particularly true in places where people have personality issues like pride and just kind of being a jerk sometimes, anger issues. These are things that are very often uncovered later. And you've probably run into people that can really speak the Christian talk. And you've been around them. You go, there is definitely something there in this person that wants to know Christ. But then they have this part of their life. Uh, pride is one of the big ones. Anger issues is another one. Well, they will say and do things. You're just like, how is this, how is this part of their Christian walk? And... The bizarre thing for us is that a lot of other people see that same behavior in the person. And, you know, being good, you know, churchgoers, we gossip about it to each other in the name of prayer requests and things like that. Have you ever heard, have you ever heard people confess other people's sins as a prayer request? We need to pray for Doug because, well, you know, him and Marge aren't getting along very well and, you know, Doug can be a little bit you know, anger, you know, you've run into that and everyone goes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the reason why that's there is Doug doesn't know it's there yet. The Holy Spirit, he's not emotionally or spiritually prepared to deal with it, and when the Holy Spirit reveals it, then he'll deal with it. And our place as a discipler, or if you're walking with a person in this place, is to love them, care for them. When the opening comes, when they begin to understand this is an issue in your life, their life, then you can start to talk about it with them. But if you just sit around and try and hammer that into them, it's not going to work. Funny enough, people don't like to be told that they're a bunch of dirt bags, and it's only by the grace of God they're going to heaven. Otherwise, they would burn in hell where they deserve to be. That doesn't really appeal to a lot of people. And some people might say, well, it's not about appealing to people. It's not about appealing to people, but it is about trying to help people to walk alongside of folks. And when you go through this, when the Holy Spirit reveals something in your life, then pay attention to it and act on it because the reason why it's been revealed in your life is now the Spirit says you're ready to deal with this. So deal with it. But really the thing that, that I have found, and I think this is probably the thing that we all struggle with the most, it takes time to really have, to participate in healthy discipleship. It takes time and time is something that a lot of us don't have, especially at a church like this where you have a lot of students, you have people who are working, uh, high, you know, high-pressure jobs, busy jobs. The time necessary to form a disciple is something that we rarely have, especially in Western society. You look at what Jesus did. What did Jesus do with his disciples? Did he meet with them once a week? Did they come to church on Saturday or Sunday or however they may have done it back then? And just that one hour, hear a one-way message and then grow as disciples? Is that how Jesus did it? No, it's not how Jesus did it. It doesn't mean what we're doing is wrong, but discipleship was Jesus living with those guys. And they walked together and they talked together. I have no idea how Peter, James, and John uh, made a living during that time. Because it says they left their nets behind and followed Jesus. I have no idea how they did it, you know. But... That wasn't uncommon. You saw back then, people would, would walk with a teacher for several years. 
as a very close tutoring relationship. It's something taken from the Greek culture. This is something that people did, and we don't do that now. We say, follow this book, we'll talk about it once a week, and this will help you become a disciple. That's not time. This Steve Rankin guy I've told you about, his job was to, was to be part of the students' lives in this university, and he had the blessing that he had financial support to do that, and that is exactly what he did. He just hung out with us. He would eat with us. He would go to the cafeteria with us and eat with us. We often had to pay for him, but that's okay. And uh, we'd go camping together. Just kind of good. I, he was from Texas, so he wanted to learn how to drive in the snow. So I taught him how to drive in the snow, which was fun. It's kind of terrifying, but it was fun. And in those times of just quantity of time together, there, there came those quality moments where we grew and he could, we could talk about Christ and we would grow. And I would tell you, parent, I tell you guys as parents too, there's this myth of quality time, that you can manufacture quality time. And, and in disciples too, that you can manufacture quality time. You can't. Quality time really comes when you have a quantity and you spend a lot of time and then within that quantity there come those nuggets, those little gold nuggets of quality. And in that quality, a life is changed. When I hang out with folks, and I've taken Steve as my model, when I hang out with folks, and some of you have experienced it, sometimes we'll just, we won't really necessarily talk about the things of the Bible, at least not right away, but it becomes part of the experience together. We have a men's coffee thing, uh, Jochen and I and some others, we meet on Thursday mornings, 7.30 in the morning, you're welcome to join us at Copenhagen Coffee if you're a man, it's kind of a men's thing, but we don't do a Bible study, we just talk. And in that time of talking, there are times we talk about Scripture. There are times we don't, but we're living life together. That's one of those little places we're living life together. And I would encourage you to do that, because I know a lot of you, you want to be in that place of discipleship making. You know that that's one of the things we're commanded to do, but how do you do it? And I can tell you it takes time. And one of the things you'll notice I didn't mention is be an expert in the Bible. You don't have to be an expert in the Bible. Steve was not an expert in the Bible, but he knew more than I did. And so, you know, when he could take me along because he knew a little bit more than I did, when we came to things that he didn't know the answer to, we would, he would take me and we would go through the Bible together to find those answers. And I've always found those, those to be the, the way of growth, like a Bible study. I want to, I wanna, yeah, the goal, I don't always do this because I kind of run off at the mouth. There's an occupational hazard of being someone that preaches now. But, you know, help people discover the connections in the Bible instead of you just doing it for them because that's how people grow. It's time. And that one year of Steve's investment in my life changed the course of my life. I don't know what person I would have been if, if he hadn't been just involved in my life during that time. And I never kept touch with him. After a year, he moved on, and I moved on. And I've been in touch with him occasionally, once or twice over the last 30 years, but we're not like super in touch. But I'll always be grateful for what he brought into my life. And this close personal walk with humanity is really what God did with us in the person of Jesus Christ. When the scripture says that God, that Christ, not thinking that equality with God was something that he had to grasp, but instead made himself into a servant, a servant obedient even unto death. This is what God did with us in the person of Jesus Christ. He enters into our lives. He enters into our brokenness of humanity. He himself is not broken, but he enters into all the effects of brokenness, the sin, the anger, all the stuff that he eventually has to deal with himself because he wants this close personal walk. And that's what he did. He he got these disciples. He lived with them, walked with them. And then when he left, they were able to carry on with the model that he had given them. And thankfully, we have the Bible that reminds us what that model should be because, unfortunately, humans are humans. And the church defaulted back to the Old Testament idea of works-based faith around 300, well, 380 AD when we became the official religion of Rome. You see the church kind of default back into this ritualistic, power-centric idea of what it means to be righteous and holy. But God is faithful to his church, 
God reforms it again and again and again. He keeps bringing people to the forefront, and his word is not changeable. And people read the word, and they understand, we need to get back on track. It happened in the Old Testament, and it's happened in the New Testament. And he gave us his Holy Spirit. And having his Holy Spirit available to live within us is beyond measure when it comes to how important that is because the Holy Spirit is that spirit that nudges you and guides you to change. Because the, the mantra of the world today is, well, I don't need to change. I'm, I'm perfect the way I am. I'm going to celebrate who I am. There's a certain degree where that's okay to, to celebrate the way you are. But if you think that you don't need to change the aspects of your life, you're dreaming. And even secular people would say, you need to be a person that's willing to be pliable and changeable. It's just, what direction are you going to change into? Are you going to change into the image of Christ? Or are you going to change to some other image? Or are you going to just stagnate and not change at all? Only one of those three options is a healthy one. Are you going to become like Christ? Are you going to become like the world? Or are you just going to sit there and stagnate? And he gave us the Holy Spirit to guide us in that place of becoming like him. But also the Holy Spirit is a, and the church is to be a place where we disciple one another. It's not just to be a top-down thing. It's not as though that I don't learn anything from you guys. And it's not as though I shouldn't need to learn anything from you guys. The world says, as the leader, I'm not supposed to have all the answers. Reality is, I don't have all the answers any more than I can say I know everything about God. And I learn. And sometimes, some of you have kept the door open of faith to me when I've been in a place that's depressed or struggling. Some of you have kept that door open by various ways of being involved in my life. Cindy is probably the main one that keeps that door open when I'm struggling, and vice versa. And as a church, this is how we are to bear one another's burdens. It doesn't mean you just take upon the, the physical burdens or the mental burdens of life, but you hold open the door when we're struggling with the burden of hope. We hold open the door when we're struggling with, you know, it seems like I'm praying and praying and nothing is happening. Is there something wrong with me? Does God not like me? We hold open those doors of hope. Of course God likes you. God loves you. But why this isn't you're going your way, why this prayer isn't being answered the way you want, I don't know. But I know it's not because God hates you. And sometimes we have to hold open those doors of hope for one another. That's what the church is supposed to be there for. Guiding each other, encouraging one another. Proverbs says, as iron sharpens iron, so two people can sharpen one another in that place of faith and hope. It's a paraphrase. And I want to encourage you to know that disciple-making, you, the, the people that you impact in your families, your friends, your workplaces, those are the people you are impacting and can potentially grow into a relationship where you are making a disciple. I'm not going to be able to make disciples of the people that you work with. I don't know who they are. Sometimes folks bring people to the church and want me to kind of talk, you know, talk Jesus into them. I can't talk Jesus into them. They don't trust me. And besides, that's not how Jesus gets into a person. You don't just talk it into a person. You don't say, well, here's what the Bible says. And they go, oh, well, that makes sense. I'm just going to go right down that road. If that were the case, we'd all be Christians in the world. It's a relationship of trust. And first they trust you, and then they're able to transfer that trust to God. They see the love in you, and then they begin to understand that love in you is really coming from God. They see things they admire in you, and they come to realize it's really not from you, it's from God. And then they stop looking at you, and they look to God. And now that person is a disciple of Jesus Christ, not a disciple of you. And that is an awesome thing. If you ever are privileged to experience that transition where a person stops looking at you and they start looking at God, it makes the Holy Spirit in your, in your soul just jump for joy. It's a wonderful thing. And I want to encourage you that it's a thing that you can be a part of. Yeah. Jesus told us, all authority on heaven and earth has been given unto me, so therefore go and make disciples. By baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
and teach them to obey every command that I gave you. So their eyes are kind of on you as an example. The Apostle Paul says this too. Look to me as an example. But it's not so their eyes stay upon you, but so they transfer to Christ because Jesus says, and I'll be with you always until the end of the age. And as soon as they stop looking at you and they start looking at me, now you've made a disciple. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your spirit that has allowed us to shape us, change us, go through the long walk of what it means to grow in you. But also, Lord, we thank you that uh, you allow us to participate in the same way with other people. And Lord, I know that, I think, I think a lot of us would, would say that it's not a normal part. We don't really often think of ourselves as disciple makers. But Father, I pray your spirit would prompt each one of us, because I know that within each one of us, there are people that we can spend our lives with if only, if only for a season, like Steve only spent one year in my life and in Cindy's life and some other students' lives. But in that one year, something profound happened. And Lord, that we have that opportunity and may we be willing to take it by discipling one another, encouraging one another, but also involving our lives into the lives of those that don't know you in a meaningful way, not just as a project, but in a truly meaningful way to see them become more like you. And I also pray, Lord, for the people who are young believers. Uh, God, may we be more proactive in reaching into their lives. And thank you and we praise you. Help us to be more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.